Um, so I'm actually glad that the talk is at 2.40 and not like 4 o'clock because I'll be asleep by then. I have no idea what time zone I'm in right now. Um, anyway, so the premise of this thing is I was reading this book called Seven Languages uh, in Seven Weeks. And uh, one of the languages in there is Ruby and the author Bruce Tate asks uh, Matt, um, what would you change if you could change one thing in Ruby? And this is what he said. So he'd basically remove the threading model that we have and replace it with a higher level advanced concurrency feature. So today I'd like to like, share with you some of those different advanced uh, models that we have and then see how you can do some of those in Ruby. Um, first we'll explore a little bit about what is concurrency, what is parallelism, look at very briefly at threads before you guys start to vomit. Um, and then uh, we'll go over, explore some of those other topics, and then some closing thoughts from my side. Um, this talk is supposed to be a lot of code, and we'll mix it in like a nice cocktail. We'll have a lot of five spoonfuls of closure, some Ruby. Uh, we'll put in a little bit of uh, Elixir and some of Erlang because of that. And then a little bit of Scala. And just so you guys don't get drunk and like fall over, we'll put in a little bit of Java as well. Um, all right. so. I did my first conference talk last month in Bangalore, and because that was my first talk, the organizers kind of advised me I should open up with a joke, and you know, it keeps people engaged and all that. Um, and I had a really good joke. I was laughing, but nobody else did. It was very awkward. So this time I thought I'll skip all that. There are no jokes in this thing. Instead, I tried looking for like, uh, you know, weird Australian stuff, like just what Joss said, and I found a ton of those. So I'll present one of those uh, like in between, and then uh, you guys can tell me if that's true or not, but remember, these are facts. It's written in the internet, <laughs> all right? All right, so what's concurrency and what's parallelism? Um, this, this thing here is an example of a concurrent system. Overall, the system is working towards a common goal. But there are people, individuals, as well as groups who are doing their own individual stuff. Everything is working at the same time. They're all doing their stuff, but the system as a whole is going towards a common goal. Whereas this thing, uh, just assume that all these trains are leaving at exactly the same time, going towards the same place. That would be the example of a parallel system, where uh, you have the same stuff being done in parallel over and over again. So today we're not going to talk about that. That's also, you guys are Ruby developers, most of you. You already know that story, and uh, we're not going to explore that too much. I'd like to talk more about the concurrency side today. There's also the evented model, which uh, Node.js, or if you have done uh, jQuery or like Ajax calls within jQuery, I'm sure you're familiar with that, where you have some sort of I.O. call, and then because you don't want to wait for that, uh, you don't want to block on that, you pass in a callback along with that. That's also another excellent way to achieve the same stuff. Uh, not going to talk about that either. All right, so threads, locks, mutexes, and blah, right? Um, very simple example, um, Ruby class counter. There's a uh, variable there called count. It's initialized to zero, and then I have a, a method there that increments it by one. And then I open up two threads and increment the stuff uh, 1,000 times inside uh, each thread. And I'm sure most of you know this already. What, who thinks uh, the answer is 2,000? Raise your hands, please. Nobody thinks it's 2,000? Good question. <laughs> that was the trick. Yes, OK. Given I'm running on MRI, who thinks it's 2,000? Awesome. So on MRI, it is 2,000. But if you do the same thing in JRuby, the top part is JRuby or Rubinius, you're going to see a number less than 2,000. Why is that? Because of the global interpreter lock, right? Um, so this operation here, and I'm trying to go to point here and then point here immediately so you guys can see that. That's actually more than one operation. And one thread could have just read the value and incremented it locally, not saved it yet. And then another thread could come back, read the same value, update it. So when that thread update, updates, uh, the first one comes along and updates again, the, the second thread's update is lost. So you'd see these kind of problems very often. Um, so how you can prevent that is with mutexes. So 
I'm going to create a mutex here, uh, and then my increment operation, I'm going to put it inside a synchronized block. block. Whoever's done Java is very familiar with this stuff. Um, yeah, so basically now my uh, only one thread can basically do the increment operation at one time, and all the other threads would be waiting till it completes. And this is very easy, it looks very clean here, but just think about how this would affect your real world applications when you don't, you're not incrementing variables, you're doing more meaningful stuff, and it takes longer time. You'd uh, have problems like deadlocks and all that. Um, it's also now things are out of sequence. You can't predict when what things will happen. So uh, it gets hard to test, to debug, and then reproduce issues. Um, even after all this, if you still want to do this stuff, there's this awesome gem from Charlie, uh, Charles Nutter, who's the guy behind JRuby. Um, and it's called ThreadSafe. Uh, it basically makes almost everything in hashes and arrays and all these fundamental stuff that we use in Ruby thread safe by, so if he didn't write this code, I wouldn't use this, but I'm sure he knows what he's doing. Basically, if you look closer at this code, he's opening up hashes and arrays, and every method he's adding a synchronized block to it. Um, yeah, so if you were to do that, yeah, that, uh, and then you could have race conditions, dead, deadlocks, and it gets very hard to debug. So today, uh, we're not going to talk about all that. I mean, ultimately, do you want to be a locksmith or do you want to write your application, right? I'll give you a few seconds to read that. All right. Um, yeah, so when you're doing mutexes and locks and all that, your primary focus when you're developing your application is going to be on that stuff, not on your application's code, which is the big benefit of using higher level abstractions. So the first one we'll talk about are atoms. Um, what do atoms give us is at the hardware level, uh, processors nowadays implement something called compare and sweep. So the earlier operation that we saw of getting the value and then setting increment and setting it that can be done within one operation by the processor. So the lovely folks in, over in the Java land uh, created this beautiful hierarchy of classes. So you have like atomic integer, atomic boolean, atomic long, atomic whatnot. And then because we need more and more stuff, there's an atomic integer array, atomic boolean array, and all that. Anyway, so it basically uses the compare and sweep uh, thing and uh, it's lock-free, non-blocking. How would you do this in Ruby? Again, our friend Charles Nutter wrote this awesome gem called Atomic. So instead of setting this, uh, the count um, uh, thing to zero initially, I will wrap it up inside an atom, right? And it could be any object. I'm just taking a simple example of taking zero. And then inside uh, the increment method, I'm calling update, which the atom gives me, and uh, this code block over here, uh, this guy, is going to generate a new value based on the current value. And when that update method is called, it's once it generates the current value, it'll set the atom to that next value, all right? So using that example, uh, the same code as before, now you'd get 2,000 in every one of your uh, Ruby implementations. Um, and this is also non-blocking. We already talked about that, so no problem about uh, deadlocks and stuff. Um, and instead of using like a simple thing like integer, you could use a complex object as well. All right, so our friends in the closure land went a step ahead. This is how you create a atom in closure, and then this is how you get the value out of it. You could also call a method called deref, or you could just call at num. Um, swap is sort of like our uh, correlated to the update method that we saw. So you give it the atom that you want to modify and a function. That function will be applied on the current value of the atom to generate the next value. Um, and then we all love active record validators and observers and all that, right? So you could do all that within the atoms itself, all in memory. So this guy is a positive number. It's again same as this guy as atom zero, but this is an inner, uh, basically a, a reader macro enclosure that uh, changes this to a function that will only accept positive numbers. Um, 
and then you could add watchers and all that to uh, uh, your closure atoms. So when the value is going to become negative, the atom will prevent it, so it'll never go beyond zero at this point. Um, retries, so uh, because atom, uh, the value could uh, be different when you read it uh, versus what you have in your thread locally, uh, it might retry. So if it sees that the value that's persisted is different from what I have right now, instead of running the atomic operation, it's going to read it again. And so your operations will have retries, so be careful about, so that method like ink, uh, be careful about not having side effects in there. Um, all right, weird fact number one. Who thinks that's true? So you guys have actually seen that stuff? All right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, next up, futures. Um, so what's a future? Um, it's heavily used, or an ideal use case is in a, when you want to make a network call and you want to have a fork in your code. So your code is uh, uh, hugging along uh, happily, and then at some point you want something from a web service, you'd create a future, and the future will go execute in a different thread, and when it's ready, and you're doing something else parallelly at the same time, when you request for the value at that point, if it is already uh, the web service or whatever the IO call is done, you would get that value. Otherwise, your code will block at that point, All right? So this is a very simple enclosure. So you create a future just by wrapping it, anything within the future uh, function, that'll go and run it in a different thread. Um, and then, uh, at A or at B, this is again, the thing with closure is all these abstractions, they have the very same API, right? So when you call at A or at B, if this operation is not done yet, it'll block, otherwise at that point you'll have that value. Um, you can also check if the value is ready before asking for it so it's not blocked and you can do more stuff uh, using that. Um, in Ruby, you, um, you guys must have used the celluloid gem makes it very easy to create futures. So in this example, I'm creating a future, and just to simulate the network effect, I'm gonna sleep for three seconds and then uh, like count 500, right? So in here, I'm in, uh, so I create the future and this thread goes off and is doing that work. So sleeping for three seconds, essentially. So I can ask, are you ready? And if not, I'm gonna just put uh, wait and then sleep for a second. And then finally, when it's ready, I can print the value here. So you'll see a few weights, and then finally the 500 number. Right? So celluloid makes it very easy to do this stuff. It makes it even easier. So let's say you have a class called cool command, and you have a method called cool beans that you want to execute within a future. What you would do is just include celluloid in your class, and then, um, and then basically you create a thread pool. So when you're using futures, you may, without knowing, you may be creating a lot of threads, which could be bad for your system because if you have like four cores, probably if you're doing intensive stuff, maybe eight threads is the max that you'd want to create. So instead, this uh, celluloid will give you a pool um, method on your class that includes celluloid, and you, you'd create a thread pool and then whenever you call dot .future along with the, uh, the method and the arguments, it'll go and select one of the threads within that thread pool, whatever is the next free one, and then run it within that, right? Um, there's other uh, gems that make uh, doing futures easy. There's this uh, Ruby thread gem, and then there's this guy called Jerry D'Antonio who presented uh, a similar talk, but he was mostly talking about the gem that, that he wrote called Concurrent Ruby. It's also an excellent gem. You guys should go and check out that talk if you have not already. Um, and we'll talk about more about that gem later on. And then there are promises, which are like siblings of futures. Uh, the only difference is futures are eager, so when you create it, it goes off on a different thread and starts working immediately. Whereas promises would rely on a different thread to deliver the operation that it needs to do. But otherwise, semantically, they're the same stuff. All right, next up, actors. So who was at RubyConf last year? So how many of you get the inside joke here? Okay. <laughs> See, that's why I don't add jokes. <laughs> um, 
Sander Love, or as some people call him, Aaron Peterson, talked about how this is Melbourne, the city. Does it make sense now? Yeah, right, so. Anyway, they're actors, so I stole his joke and all that, because people don't laugh at my jokes like you guys. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we'll look uh, at Elixir and Erlang to see the actor philosophy. So actors are essentially, all right, I, I moved too fast. I should be here, because now you guys are just reading the code. Don't read the code yet. Uh, <laughs> actors are essentially processes or threads that you have their own mailbox, so to speak, so they have a queue of things to do, and you pass messages to those, and they run them sequentially, all right? Um, Erlang is very famous for this stuff because <clears throat> you can create, Erlang processes are very lightweight, and you can create like thousands and thousands of Erlang processes. So we'll take an example uh, using Elixir. It's almost the same code in Erlang, uh, but Elixir makes it much easier to read, more Ruby-like, so it used that here. Uh, so we have a module called player, and there's a method called loop, which takes a name for a player. We're trying to write a tennis game where Federer and Rafa are going to play a just practice, right? So you take the name, and then receive is going to wait for a message to come in, right? And when the message comes in, it's going to uh, pattern match the mes message, so you could have multiple blocks like this. Um, and then when, when the message comes in, it tries to match it. If it matches, it executes the code within that. Simple stuff. Um, spawn is the way you create a new process in Erlang. And spawn link is, it also creates a process, but it links to your current uh, process so that if the process crashes, it will notify my current process, and you can restart it, or things like that. Um, you can send a message to that, uh, that process like this, uh, and this is the message that will pattern match with this here, this block here. And, or you can also register the process with a name, and then there on, you don't need a handle to this object anymore, the process anymore, you can just call like that. So we'll take a real uh, look at the code. All right, so. Okay, because of the screen space, it's going to look ugly, but anyway. So we have the same loop again, and uh, I'm going to add another player, which is going to be Rafa, and a catchphrase that this player is usually heard shouting, like uh, vamos, right, for Rafa. So you're going to wait for messages when it comes in. If it's a serve message, you're going to say I'm serving, and send another message to the other player, and you're going to send play next as the uh, message inside there, and the number one. Number one is the rally count, so that's where the tennis, like the rally will start. And after doing that, you'd have to start the loop function again, because you want to wait for the next message, right? So when this starts, and we ask Federer to start, serve, he would send the message to Rafa, and Rafa will get this message, and it'll come to the same code again, but now it's running in a different process. Um, here, play next and rally count would be one. So to simulate like a tennis shot, we're going to sleep for 700 uh, milliseconds, decide if it's an unforced error or not, and yeah, the player just gets to decide. This is a very weird tennis game. And then the shot, if it's a backhand or forehand. Now, if it's an unforced error, then he's going to shout no and send, uh, tell the other player, go ahead, celebrate the point. Otherwise, it's going to send the other player, uh, play next, and increase the rally count. So this is the important part here, the rally count. So the, the state is not part of the object or the module that I wrote. Instead, the state, which is the rally count that I'm increasing, is part of the message. And this is very idiomatic in Erlang or Elixir, that the state information would be part of the message. So the next time, it comes in here, it would read the current rally count and go from there. And celebrate point is very simple, like he'll start serving again after a while. So let's go ahead and run this and see how it works. Uh, right, so. Um, yeah, so they're playing games and the rally count is increasing. Just remember, the rally count is not part of the uh, module itself, it's part of the message. That's how they're communicating with each other. And then there you go, Rafa won, and Rafa started serving again. And yeah, so it'll go on forever because I didn't write any like scoring system or how to tell them to like win and stop playing. They'll just, I 
just die. They shouldn't die, so I'll just kill the process. Um, all right, so that's how you write that in Elixir. Um, processes in Erlang are very lightweight. So in the JVM, like I said, if it's four cores, you'd probably want to create not more than eight to 10 threads. Uh, in Elixir, it's like easily you would see um, tens of thousands of processes uh, running as actors. Uh, the React database is built on top of Erlang, and so is today's hot news WhatsApp. WhatsApp uses a lot of Erlang to do some of this stuff. Um, there's a philosophy of fault tolerance. So in Ruby, we would usually try to rescue from known exceptions and try to handle stuff. Whereas in uh, Erlang or in Elixir, it would, so if you don't handle something, the process just dies. But the process that started it is notified of it and it can restart it. So that's usually how things go. This, uh, there's a beautiful library called OTP. It started off as open telephony platform, I believe, in the 1970s. It's not related to telephony anymore, which makes it easy to like, do this kind of stuff. And the, another beautiful thing that we'll uh, see in actors today is all these other things that we're talking about, like atoms and we'll see closures, STM and all, they're all running within the bounds of a single computer. Whereas in Erlang, you could take one of the Rafa actor or Federer actor, and you could run it on a different server altogether. And the code remains exactly the same. It's like beautiful to this, like uh, scale that way. So in Ruby, Celluloid does an excellent job again. Um, we'll just take a look at the actual code instead of trying to show you all that. All right, so require Celluloid, and then I create the player. In here, I'm going to keep the name, phrase, and other player as the attributes of the class instead of passing it again and again, which is the idiomatic Ruby way. Um, serve is just going to take the other player, and then instead of calling play next, which would just invoke the method on there, it'll call async before that. So that sends a message to the other, uh, other actor. Um, and then the code is almost the same for all these other guys. And we'll start Federer off uh, with a player.supervise as. So supervise as in Celluloid gives you similar functionality as Erlang's fault tolerance, some of it. Um, so if the process dies or the thread dies, you would be notified of it and you can restart it or read what happened to it, stuff like that. Uh, I'll create Rafa and then tell Federer that your other player is Rafa and then ask Federer to serve. And I'm not going to show you an example, but it's basically, you'll see similar output as we saw before. Right, so that's um, all for that topic. Next up is agents. And this is another thing that, is, that has become popular because of closure. Um, agents are sort of like atoms, if you remember all the stuff that I told you already. Atoms are going to change the value within an atomic operation. Agents uh, will basically do the same thing, but in a different thread. So while atom is synchronous, this is asynchronous. All right, so here's Mr. Smith, and then we tell him that you have like 100 health, I guess. Um, DREF is same as before as atom, as all the other stuff that we have seen. And this is how you send, uh, send a message to Mr. Smith. So I'm going to ask him to sleep for three seconds and then fight like crazy with whoever is coming in. Um, so yeah, the similarities between, um, I guess, actors and this also, some of you might see that. Uh, but the focus here in actors, the actors are already know exactly what kind of messages are going to come in. So you have already written all that down. Whereas in agents, the focus is more on just sending a block of code, let it do, it, let it do its thing. Um, the life cycle um, of actor is basically like, unlike future, uh, where you would, you would create a future and then ask for the value again at a later point, agents is more, more, more or less you would let it go live on its own life. You'll send messages once in a while. So this is a thing like where you'd want to maybe log to a file or somewhere once in a while, right? Um, and agents will never block. So, if the operation is not complete, it'll tell you whatever was the previous value. It'll never block, so no deadlocks and stuff. Again, validators and watchers you can do as before. Um, 
and in almost everything you can do that. Unlike Elixir's or Erlang's uh, fault tolerance in agents, if you send a bad message, it's just going to die and uh, it won't notify you. There's no way for you to be notified of that. You have to manually check for that if there was an error. And of course, once you check, you can uh, restart it and all that. So the concurrent Ruby gem um, that I talked about has excellent agent support. Uh, it can do all the validators, observers, it can even do rescues. So you can define some exceptions that when this happens, restart or handle it in some way. Uh, you should go check it out. Won't go into too much detail right now. All right, STM. Um, I guess everybody's excited about that, or not really? Raise your hands, please. Okay, I see about 10 hands. Anyway, I was very excited to hear about STM, like a concept like that and how you could do that. Um, what's STM is, you guys all deal with databases, so you have transactions. STM is almost the same thing. So in memory, you could create a transaction and you could have multiple values that are all going to change or they're not going to change. So it's a transaction in that sense. Um, so here, because it's a transaction, we'll take a banking example. Alice here has $1,000, Bob has 2,000, and they both have validators that say that they should, the balance should not go below zero. And then we have a transfer count, which is a eight atom, and, and we'll keep a count of how many times of transactions are going on. Um, and then this method here basically takes the from account, the to account, and an amount, do sync starts the transaction, and within the transaction, we first increment the transfer count over here, this guy, Decre decrease uh, Alice's account with that amount, and increase Bob's account, or whatever the input is. So Alice starts with $1,000, and I'm going to try to transfer $100 from her account to Bob 25 times, all right? Which shouldn't happen, uh, you should be at max be able to transfer 11 times. So if you run that code, you'd see this exception uh, after the 11th transfer, transfer that the uh, validation failed. At that point, if you ask Alice, she'd say I have zero, Bob would have 3,000, and the transfer count would be 11, right? So this is how closure basically, because of the validators, it didn't let you, even though you wanted to run that code 25 times, it told uh, you that these guys cannot go below zero, so all the other 25 minus 11 calls basically retried and failed. Um, so these calls are all atomic. Um, Alice, uh, or you saw the transfer count. Even though the transfer count was incremented before Alice was decremented here, which is what would have invalidated the thing, transfer count was also rolled back, right? So it became 11. It would have become 12 and then came back to 11 again. So these are all atomic changes. Um, they're all consistent. Uh, at the end of this, if you ask uh, how, what is the value, you're always going to see the same thing, whether it's multiple threads calling it or not. If multiple threads do call the same block of code, the effect of one within that transaction is not going to be available in the other thread. So it's isolated. And, but they're not durable. So if the closure, uh, like you kill the REPL or the process, when it comes back up, you won't see the same values again, of course. Uh, you need to persist that to disk. So unlike database acidity, uh, it's not durable. These things are synchronous, just like atoms. They happen within the same thread, and they also retry, so you have to be careful about not having side effects inside of there. In Ruby, there's not really a good STM library. Actually, in a lot of languages, it's not there yet. Um, but uh, you could always take Alice and Bob, put it in a list, create an atom out of it, and then do it that way. Even in Clojure, I've seen a lot of programmers prefer to do that instead of using refs and a STM. And there's, Intel is uh, apparently building hardware transaction memory, so this would, just like uh, compare and sweep, this would become available at the processor level, and that would be like amazing for everybody. Um, all right, time for a second weird fact. Is that true? Yes. Seriously? <laughs> what? It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> All right. So last part is uh, channels and CSP. So um, 
This is heavily inspired by Go, and then Clojure people wrote something called core.async, which is a library that you can uh, build as part or include as part of your Clojure setup. I'm going to use Clojure because I'm more used to that, but the semantics are almost the same in Go. Um, this is how you create a channel. C is a channel now. And then when you, this is how you read from a channel. Now when you read from a channel, if there's nothing in the channel, it's going to block. So I'm doing that inside the thread. Otherwise I can never run the next statement here. And then when I write this out, then the thread will print the previous values, right? Uh, channels are unbuffered. So when you try to read from one, there's nothing in it, it'll block immediately. Uh, so you could create a buffered channel like that, so it'll hold up to 20 values. If you're trying to write the 21st value, and there are already 20 things in the channel unprocessed, then it'll block at that time, right? And then uh, otherwise the semantics are same. And then there's also dropping and sliding buffers. So dropping means if you write the 21st value and there are 20 things unprocessed in the channel, it'll just drop it silently, right? Very nice. Um, and then sliding buffer, you write the 21st, there are 20 things already, the first one will be dropped, dropped off the queue. Why does Clojure do that? Why is there no, they could have built something that would just increase automatically, right? The thing there is, that shows that your producer and consumer are at a different rate, and you're going to eventually see this problem in production. So instead of that, don't try to build un, like uh, basically automatically increasing buffers, handle the problem right in your development setup. And then there are amazing like map level functions. Um, so you could run a map across the whole channel, this is all asynchronously, and then collate all the results together, which would be amazing efficiency. And finally, uh, go blocks. So this code that you see is actually evented code. So like in Node.js, if you were trying to do this, you would read from the channel, and then you would pass in a callback, that says when the channel has returned, put the value in X and then go on to the next callback. And there again you would wait, when that comes back you would put that result in Y and then at the third level you would say okay join X and Y, all right? So in here what the go block does is very clever. Um, it inspects your, this block for any channel reading and creates a state machine out of this stuff. So at the first step, um, the state machine has just one step that waits for the channel, but it doesn't block. It's called a parking state, and it's on a different thread altogether. Um, so when the channel reads something, it's going to associate the value X with the whatever it read from the channel and transform to the next state, which is now I have a value X and then wait for something else from the channel. When that comes in, it transforms to the next state, so it has X and Y. And at that point, there are no more uh, stuff to read from the channel, so it'll execute that block at that point. So this is amazingly efficient. Uh, you could, like, trivial operations like this, you could run, like, a 10,000 within less than a second uh, using Go blocks, um, which is, like, uh, very different from uh, if you were using pure threads. And uh, there's an agent gem that uh, the Google guy called Ilya Grigoric, he wrote up. It's excellent, go read the source code, uh, really good stuff. You could do the same stuff in Ruby using that gem. All right, closing thoughts. Learn about all these technologies, learn about all of these things because right now you may have a problem that you don't know that this could be the answer to. Uh, and experiment with all of these things, experiment with Elixir, go out, go, closure, all of these things, play with them so you have the knowledge when you need it, but when it comes to Ruby, try to keep it simple. In fact, in any language, I would say, try to keep it simple. One of the easiest ways to scale your software is to have multiple processes and stuff, uh, basically queues, maybe external queues, SQS, RabbitMQ, whatever, they're communicating between each other. This way, when you need to scale beyond one machine, you can easily put this process outside in a different machine. But uh, you can do all of these uh, advanced features that we saw already, and yes, of course, that's open to you as well. And uh, don't be afraid to mix all different technologies. I see stuff where we do Ruby, so we'll always keep on doing Ruby, or we do PHP, where's the PHP guy right there? So we'll always keep on doing PHP. 
Um, I was talking to Chad Fowler last month in Bangalore. So he used to work with us in Living Social. Now he works uh, in a company called Wonderkinder in Germany. He says that their production system comprises of all of these things. All right? And they all talk to each other via Thrift or HTTP. And uh, because of this, they don't see any coupling between their systems. Because you can't couple anything if you're using freaking like Node.js along with Scala and Clojure and all that, which is one benefit. I'm not go saying that you should go and do this to your production systems, but don't be afraid of mixing things. And that's it. I flew a long way over, and I'm really glad to be here. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>